Our second scripture reading from the New Testament comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by Him. For the Lord disciplines those whom He loves, and chastises every child whom He accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, when you are illegitimate, then you are illegitimate and not His children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share His holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. For this season of Lent, we are returning um, to our historical roots in Methodism and to what brought about this movement and denomination that we are now a part of. Um, and it very much began in um, intentionality around spiritual discipline. And so we come to this season of Lent, to a season of spiritual discipline, to intentionally prepare ourselves um, for the Feast of Easter. Because it is easy, right, to skip over the painful pieces that discipline are. And as a kid, it's harder for us to get away from that because we have parents, um, physical parents right here in our presence, pulling us back and not letting us get away with it. But yet, as adults, we get really good at sidestepping God's discipline. And so this is a season where we come to be honest about that and to open ourselves in a way that normally we don't do, to hear a word and a truth from God, a hard word and a hard truth, to go through some pain um, in whatever our discipline is that we choose for this season, um, but because it's worth it, because of the fruit of righteousness, because of the foundation that it brings, because what was out of joint gets healed and we become stronger and more whole and better able to be the people that God created us to be. And this is every choice that we make every day, right? Because if there's anything that we can count on, it's for horrible things, unfair things, unjust things to happen. So how are we going to respond? Are we going to let these experiences put us out of joint and remain there? Are we going to shut down? Or are we going to let God's grace, God's love, God's power heal us, as painful as that physical therapy and that soul therapy can be, are we going to walk that road intentionally so that we can come through healed and alive and whole? The prophet Joel sends out this exact call to his community. He sends this call out right after there has been an 
horrible incidents of a plague of locusts coming and just destroying everything in Jerusalem. The city is spinning out of control, not knowing how to come back from what just happened. Sound familiar? And so the prophet comes and calls out. This is the text that begins every Lenten season, each Ash Wednesday. A text to blow the trumpet, a text to be aware of what has happened, but in such a way that we rend our hearts, in such a way that we take in what has happened and give God space that we didn't give God before space to teach us, to show us something that we hadn't been seeing, space in which repentance means a physical and literal turning and returning to who our creator is, who our life source is, who our truth is, who our salvation is. Repentance of sin is a repentance of harm. And just as those people in Jerusalem were suffering from the harm that the locusts did to them, so we have communities all around our world, especially in Parkland today, suffering from the harm that has been done to them. So will this bring a tearing of heart, a complete reordering of priorities, a complete shifting of how we use our time, who we understand ourselves to be, and what we understand as most important in life. And these are the exact questions that John Wesley was asking of himself and of others. We just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, of Martin Luther doing his extra extra on the doors of Wittenberg and calling an account to the corruption that had been done by the Catholic Church, saying that it's not just about what you buy or what you do with your money to have an indulgence to get out of heaven free or to you know, keep a list of all the good works. There's something that has to happen internally that we are saved by faith through God's grace. That what we do will never be fully enough. That's why we have God's grace to be there to meet us, to help us and empower the transformation. And then in the 1600s, as the Protestant Reformation goes, and we have all of this pietist movement that it's all about inner faith. And, and in trying to correct that pendulum swing of checklists of good works so much, we go to the opposite extreme in the 1600s, and it is about inner faith only, and who cares about good works? Leave that to be. And so by the time we get to John Wesley in the 1700s, John Wesley and many others are trying to find a middle way where good works and transformation are present and where inner life and transformation of faith is also present. And as a purple congregation in a world divided into partisanship right now, we too are trying to find a middle way as citizens of the kingdom of God. And the funny thing is that John Wesley started in Lent in 1725. And in his journal, he writes this. The mediating emphasis of the via media, that middle way, is seen because I was early warned against laying, as the papists do, too much stress on outward works or, as the radical Protestants do, on a faith without works, which, as it does not include, so it will never lead to true hope or charity. The balance between faith and good works, the following of virtuous tempers, and the use of all the means of grace which God provided would help me have the mind that was in Christ and walk as he walked. And it was his reading of Jeremy Taylor in which Wesley adopted the first rule of holy living as care of your time. And so that's when he started to keep a diary of a record of measures of his progress in holy living. 
and his discovery that holiness was an inner reality. His quote now, that true religion is seated in the heart and that God's, God's law extends to all our thoughts as well as our words and actions. The middle way, that God's law is seated in our heart, that there is inner transformation around God's truth, but that that extends to all of our thoughts as well as words and actions and outer deeds and how we relate to one another. So Wesley was really engaged in the right state of soul. And consequently, his method was not a static, settled scheme, but rather an approach to life that grew and developed and changed as he confronted different crises, had further insights, and met new friends. This is where our practical theology comes into play. Our denomination did not come over a break in doctrine. It came over a search for the right state of soul. It came out of a struggle to find a middle way. And so we too come. And as John Wesley turned to Genesis 1, 27, in his sermon he writes, They who have saved others from sin and its attendant death shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They who have reprinted the image of God on many souls as stars forever and ever. It is a call to shine. It is a call to shine inwardly and outwardly to share that grace that transforms us with our communities. For Wesley, this is from the Book of Discipline. For Wesley, there is no religion but social religion, no holiness but social holiness. The communal forms of faith in the Wesleyan tradition not only promote personal growth, they also equip and mobilize us for mission and for service into the world. And so we proclaim no personal gospel that fails to express itself in relevant social concerns. But we also proclaim no social gospel that does not include the personal transformation of sinners. This is the calling that we are founded in, to be a middle way that brings both of these together. And the best tool that Wesley could find that we'll be looking at next week is doing that in small groups. In small groups that, excuse me, nope, not gonna cough, okay? <laughs> it's small groups um, that make discipline possible for the experience of individuals and the life of the church to have accountability from the community of saints by those who claim that community support so that it is in love that we hold ourselves accountable. For support without accountability promotes moral weakness, but accountability without support is a form of cruelty. We want neither cruelty nor moral weakness, but we do want the transformation of the world. And so we come to this Lenten journey, and our call to discipleship that I would ask for you to consider is to take up a spiritual discipline. And the insert of the bulletin is a list of the disciplines that Wesley required of his folks in the Holiness Club that we'll get into next week, and then also um, in his small groups, the class meetings and bands, and then later of his pastors. Um, I am... And that is part of the reason that we will have communion every Sunday because that was one of the sacraments that Wesley called us to take as often as possible um, since it is one of the means of grace to receive God's love and God's power to be able to live differently that Christ commanded us to do in, in the words that we will share in just a moment of remember in Christ. Um, I personally am working on fasting. You know how much I love my food and how I turn to that to get through hard times. Um, Wesley refused to ordain anyone who did not fast both on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, 
it would have been really hard to get my ordination back in 1730s. <laughs> um, and so for six weeks, 